I'm Francesca Frontini, and uh, I'm here co-chairing the session with Juliana van der Leck, our training officer. Uh, this session is kind of a um, become a regular appointment at Claren conferences because we believe that this topic is very crucial for for the life and future of our infrastructure. We have a packed program. Okay, it's here. Uh, we will just give a very, very quick introduction so that you are up to date with the, our, the latest developments uh, in our training uh, activities. Uh, then we will have a very interesting presentation on uh, processing Europeana with Jupyter Notebooks. This uh, topic has been uh, uh, hinted at a couple of times already. And then this meat of the matter, it's the three presentations, uh, uh, the three training materials that uh, we are featuring today and that have been deposited uh, in our uh, training platform. So teaching and training is very much uh, a core component of Clarin and in particular of what we call the knowledge infrastructure, the knowledge sharing infrastructure. And this is not just uh, about Clarin. I mean, this uh, the recognition that uh, teaching and training activities are important uh, for research infrastructures, that it's not just about uh, putting the resources there, but also making sure that people know how to use them. Uh, this has been recognized by, by other infrastructures, uh, such as SES, that you can see how prominent training is in their website by uh, Daria with the, the initiative, such a, an initiative such as Daria Campus. And last but not least, by uh, the shock marketplace that we've heard about yesterday, which uh, is, uh, gives training materials a prominent place. So last year, in 2021, we launched uh, our training portal. And uh, in, uh, in conjunction with, uh, with this, in fact, uh, the Teaching with Clarin Award. So we uh, invited people to deposit, to, to share with us their training materials. And we uh, started, kick-started this initiative of giving an award to the uh, more, most in, more interesting uh, and uh, more relevant ones. Uh, indeed, Sharing training materials as digital objects uh, opens up a, a plethora of, uh, of uh, questions, of uh, uh, issues uh, about metadata, about how to make them visible, citable, about persistent uh, identifiers, uh, about versioning and licensing, in general about the fairness uh, of, of these resources. We've just started to, I mean, we came up with uh, some proposal, in particular Juliana with a set of uh, metadata, but uh, Indeed, uh, there's still a lot of work to do, and not just uh, alone, but in uh, in alignment uh, with other initiatives uh, within the, the SSH and uh, uh, within the broader communities uh, of open data. So in 2022, so this year, we renew our uh, uh, initiative uh, the, and the award, and uh, we uh, decided to focus a little bit more on uh, what we call the core clearing services. So teaching materials that would uh, help people uh, use uh, the VLO, the switchboard, uh, the federated content search, uh, our deposit and citation services uh, more effectively. And uh, this was done in conjunc conjunction also with uh, the upskills uh, project. And uh, in, in addition to this, we also con concentrated on uh, other topics such as uh, automatic speech recognition and forced alignment. We also organized, uh, uh, together with Martin Wynn, uh, a teaching with Clarin workshop at the TALC conference. And uh, yeah, and now I'm handing over to Juliana to tell us what's next. Yes. Um, so next, uh, the course that um, the courses that uh, Francesca just mentioned are integrated in the upskills curriculum for language and linguistic students uh, at the bachelor level mm -hmm. in programs uh, all over Europe. And uh, we plan to finalize this learning content by February 2023. Uh, they will be tested, uh, translated, uh, and piloting. I'm talking here only about the Clarin related courses. Clarin Italy also already showed interest in uh, piloting this, um, um, this course uh, in, uh, in their institute. And as you can see, the consortium partners in Upskills are developing more interest, uh, interesting topics uh, on, uh, on other. Um, in other areas, such as analytical thinking and problem solving, uh, collecting data from human subjects, uh, introduction to language data standards and repositories, this is, this is our course, and introduction to uh, scientific research, uh, language data science, and so on. If you are interested in piloting any of these um, 
uh, learning content, please uh, visit us uh, this afternoon at the bazaar. In collab close collaboration with the University of Bologna, we are also proud to announce um, uh, a, a, an internship program with the students, MA students from the Department of Translation. Um, this um, has um, take this initiative was born um, based on the nice dynamics and uh, collaboration in the Upskirts project. So we are very looking forward to this uh, new uh, program. And uh, both in Upskirts uh, in the Upskirts project and also some surveys that we have run uh, with industry partners hiring uh, student graduates. Uh, we have noticed that there is a much interest in uh, teaching students how to process uh, large data sets. So um, we plan to take a closer look at these uh, text processing tutorials with Jupyter Notebooks. And next, I'm going to give the floor to Michal. Yes. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Francesca and Francisca and Daria and Alex and Tuan and all the developers who uh, gave me a lot of feedback on the learning content in the Upskis project. Thank you. Yeah, lovely. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Michal Gavor, and today I will, yeah, I will talk swiftly about the workshop uh, that we have prepared with uh, Tuan and in, with the, in cooperation with Europeana. Uh, so the basic idea for the workshop was to use Europeana data with Clarin uh, processing the pipeline and consolidate into the teaching material using the Jupyter Notebooks. Um, for those who are not familiar with what Jupyter Notebook is, it's basically a computable document. So the textual document that allows you to execute interpreted code within it. And here we have the very a short example of how the Jupyter Notebook looks like. We have the markup at the top, so the start of subsection, some, um, inter, um, some text, and under that you can see the gray box that allows you for code execution. And under the gray box, you can see the result of the execution of the code within the document. Um, the goal uh, of the workshop was uh, basically to uh, multifold like the multi goals that we wanted to achieve. Like the first main goal was from which the workshop was born was to promote Europeana historical newspapers resources that Europeana makes available. Uh, but also obviously to promote Clarin NLP services along the, the data. Um, also to teach the participants how to navigate through the metadata in order to access the resources of their interest um to explore the the Jupyter notebooks and Jupyter hub applicability for the virtual classroom and for the teaching and to test the feasibility of complete programming pipeline from metadata to nlp processing output using the um, uh, the Jupyter notebooks um so um if Jupyter uh, notebook by itself is uh, something like a workbook from the traditional school where you hand out the, the uh, instructions and the place for, for solutions to, to students. Uh, Jupyter Hub is the virtual classroom in which you can hand out multiple notebooks, multiple instances of the notebooks to your students um, with the shared data, with uh, centralized authentication, centrally deployed. Um, that is the container friendly and the concept of the workshop itself. Uh, so we got from Europeana the newspaper dumps and we had the CMDI metadata about those dumps. Uh, we have extracted the dumps and provided them within the environment in the Jupyter Hub. And uh, in the notebooks, we have prepared the um, three uh, sections for um, uh, introducing the concepts, as I said, of the first, exploring the metadata, choosing the, the resources of interest, and then processing them with the NLP services provided by the Clarin PL in our case, because of my personal uh, familiarity with the services provided by the Polish branch. Um, the workshop itself took uh, 35 minutes of tutorial, 35 minutes of exercises with 10 minute break, 
uh, we have prepared the, the Jupyter Hub. We had 16 participants uh, with two breakout rooms for the exercise part. Uh, in each, uh, there was one supervisor, me and Tuan, in order to provide help to participants. Um, we have distributed the credentials to participants so they could log in during the tutorial, but as well to use them after the tutorial because the notebooks were persistent. Um, and uh, they are still available from our GitHub repository to be launched with a single click on the binder. Um, the feedback that we got from the uh, workshop that we prepared, uh, out of 16 participants, seven of them have took part in the feedback poll and six were satisfied. One was completely satisfied, but when we look at the how participants have um, marked the, the difficulty of, of the workshop, we can see that one said that it's very difficult, four said that it was difficult, and only for two, it was neither difficult nor easy. So lessons that we learned from the, the workshop, the, through the internal evaluation, we have found the four main aspects in which we can evaluate ourselves. So um, the communication. Communication is the key and the uh, alignment with the audience. So specification of the audience, the required skill set for those who can participate in the workshop, the recommended skill set for the participants, as well as the end goal for the, the uh, what is to be achieved for the participants that take part in our workshop. Um, and also the uh, virtual classroom, what limitation comes with the uh, being in the online environment that uh, you as the supervisor really have to proactively check on participants in order to get some interactions that uh, participants, when they meet obstacle, especially in the virtual setup, are rather reluctant to ask questions. They will try to fight the obstacle themselves instead of ask the question. So it's very important to proactively check on the participants. Um, if it comes to the educational content, um, our mistake that we made is probably um, not enough of the pre-tutorial materials that participants could self-check whether indeed they possess the minimal required set of skills. Uh, as well as links to recommended reading for the recommended set of skills. Um, if it comes to the infrastructure, the Claren infrastructure, um, what is important to note that tools and services may have limited throughput. And that is especially problematic when we prepare the workshop, when we have participants that work in parallel together. At the same time, they send requests to be processed and that may be limited by the throughput of the service. So we have uh, limited the, the maximal size of the task that they could send in order to avoid any clashes, cues, especially that the workshop, the, the exercise part took only 35 minutes. So waiting for the task to be finished uh, um, could really um, take a lot of time from the, the, the exercise part. Um, and in the end, that coped well with uh, 16 simultaneous participants, and we experienced no problem if it comes to the infrastructure, but those are things that have to be taken into account when you prepare the workshop. Uh, if it comes to admission and registration, um, we had quite high interest on uh, our workshop, 300 views on Eventbrite. Um, but during the preparation of the, the workshop, we had the change in target audience. That is uh, quite important in order to adjust the, the materials. And uh, that is also connected with the problems of um, those minimal and recommended skill sets that you uh, assume a given target audience possesses. Um, the registration was organized through the waiting list and you could register till the very last day before the workshop. And the participants were selected at random day before the event. Um, but even though um, after our internal evaluation, we uh, have established that it was communicated clearly, we still got at least two users, one via Twitter, reporting that they were expecting an invitation, um, but they did not receive one even though uh, it was communicated 
from our point of view quite clearly that it is random choice and if you don't get the invitation it means you are not selected for the workshop um, so to reuse the the uh, uh, Jupyter notebooks that we have created for the future uh, workshops possibly uh, it is crucial to profile the target audience um, evaluate the materials in terms of the target audience and provide the fair clear description for recommended skills so there are no clashes and the uh, participants will not find the tutorial too hard full of obstacles uh, open questions that we are left with um, whether the two parts tutorial wouldn't be better if we have the tutoring part first and then left the time to participants so they could try themselves the workshop and then after one day reconvene and ask questions um, also how to encourage the invoke interactions not only between supervisor and the, the people participating in the virtual meeting but also try to encourage students uh, or participants to change ideas between them um, and also how to actually arrange long-term or longer-term support for notebooks, what that would actually mean, what would be requirements, what uh, functionalities do we need from that for the longer support. Um, as we are out of time, um, there will be no time for questions, but we'll have our own stall at the bazaar, so I kindly invite you to, to ask the questions there. And thank you very much for your attention. Uh, okay, thank you for the floor. So I will be presenting the resource What's on the Agenda Topic Modeling Parliamentary Debates Before and During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Um, there are three authors. One is me, Aida Pritnar Jagar. I am a computational anthropologist and a researcher at the Faculty of Computer and Information Science at the University of Ljubljana and the Institute of Contemporary History. Uh, Christina. Pahor Damaiti is a PhD student uh, in linguistics, and she's currently focusing on socially unacceptable discourse. And finally, there's Daria Fischer, which, uh, who <laughs> is well known to you, uh, I suppose. Uh, she's the current executive director of Clarion Eric, uh, associate professor at the University of Ljubljana and a senior research fellow at the Institute of Contemporary History. So what motivated us? for the, um, to, to create the, the tutorial, we felt that there's need for more resources for complete beginners in digital humanities, specifically resources that do not require uh, participants to code, because we felt that this is um, a high entry point, a, a difficult entry point. Uh, the second um, motivation was the to topic modeling. So topic modeling is a very popular method in digital humanities, but we felt that um, it's not sufficiently explained or sufficient that researchers are not sufficiently familiar with the topic. Uh, so we wanted to expand on that. And finally, we had access to Parliament Corpora, which were just published. So there was a, this beautiful resource uh, available to us that we could use and um, do the analysis on. So the training resource focuses mostly on topic modeling on the use case of parliamentary data from the parliament corpus. Uh, the aim was to present Latin direct the location, uh, how it works, when to use it, the pros and cons, uh, and we presented three practical tasks in the end. So how to use topic modeling on three specific research questions. Uh, the target audience are complete beginners in digital humanities uh, because we are using a tool for visual programming where uh, participants don't need to know how to code, but instead assemble visual components into a workflow. The expected workload is, this is a very rough estimation, uh, I would say five hours. We had two two day uh, two workshops. One was a two day workshop and one was a one day workshop. And I believe that in, in a two day workshop, we had just enough time to cover everything. There were, of course, some challenges in creating this tutorial because we are working with extremely large corpus, especially the British uh, part of the Parliament corpus. Uh, and since we were working on personal computers, this required a lot of space, a lot of memory. Uh, so this was 
somewhat of an issue. Uh, we had to implement support for condo files in the software that we were using. Um, the One of the biggest problems was also deciding between the length of the tutorial and the, the amount of details that we wanted to include, because it's in the current uh, state, the tutorial is still very long, but we wanted to be very specific in how to perform each task. So I think that now we have about, like we achieved a nice um, a balance between the two. And we had to introduce some novel visualizations, for example, the LDA vis that you see on the right side um, to support exploration of the data. Uh, the resource we consider to be highly adaptable because we, it can be used as an extended homework for a group project. Uh, the biggest advantage is that it can be used with other corpora, not just parliament, uh, but it, the, the workflow can be easily replaced. Um, I mean, uh, different corpora from parliament uh, family can be easily inserted into the workflow, uh, but any uh, Konlu uh, corpus or otherwise can be used in the same format, in the same workflow. Uh, there's one task per example, so, or there's one example per research question. Uh, so uh, the users can select either to just follow one task or a combination uh, of the three tasks. Uh, and there's an easy explanation of LDA, which can be taken and used in different uh, settings, teaching settings so that the students uh, learn more about the method. Uh, so this is it. I hope you get to uh, see and explore the tutorial. You're very welcome to try it out. Uh, and feel free to write me if you're interested in any aspect of the resource. Thank you very much. Um, it's been made open access only quite recently. And we are still eagerly waiting for our colleagues who are going to integrate it in their curriculum to give feedback to, to figure out so whether we were successful uh, or not quite so. Hopefully, yes. Um, so, well, um, actually, uh, we aimed at uh, creating an interactive and easily adaptable material, uh, which is devoted um, particularly to one aspect of language, collocations, their learning, teaching, and translation, uh, and primarily from or into Lithuanian. Uh, but then on the other hand, uh, we think that activities, they may really be easily uh, uh, adapted to other languages as well. And uh, this, as you can see, it resulted in a resource book and an uh, accompanying website where readers can find answers to most of the exercises. Um, sometimes I know that when the presentations are boring to listen, uh, we like to scroll. So I would really invite you to open the resource book when I'm talking and to look at the content and how it's structured. Um, so you would uh, uh, also see how it visually looks like. Um, so you now uh, the book, consists of two parts. Uh, the first uh, aiming at Lithuanian language teachers and learners, and the second one is uh, for the audience interested in translation studies. Um, and you can see the, the topics listed here. Uh, well, the, for the purpose of illustration, I'll mostly refer to the second part of the book that I was in charge of. Uh, um, now, we believe that uh, the different audiences will really find different ways uh, uh, how to use the material. And um, for some, maybe they will integrate the, the whole book into the, the course. Uh, others uh, may be more interested in interactive exercises, or, or maybe some uh, will not even use them, but will be inspired to create something on your, their own and to adapt them to other languages. So. Uh, we think that uh, the applications, they are unlimited as long as someone is interested in collocations, Lithuanian and translation. Uh, now, naturally, uh, we wanted uh, to show our audience the ways and possibilities how uh, open access language resources can be helpful. Um, and on the one hand, our audience is really broad. Um, and may not have this prior knowledge in corpus linguistics. So we, you know, we try to avoid this complex terminology. Um, 
And then in some cases, uh, we would give references to potentially useful resources for some activity types, uh, leaving it up to the reader to decide on the depth of the information uh, he or she wants to figure uh, individually further on. And as a second step, uh, we hope we succeeded in showing how various language resources can be useful in developing exercises. Um, so the large number of uh, tasks uh, draw on the data uh, that we extracted from the Lithuanian Clarence repository. Uh, um, it, it was really useful for us uh, for exercise development. Um, then certainly for the more advanced learners, uh, we suggest activities which already require uh, students to access, to download uh, uh, the data, to analyze uh, the data themselves. So it's in a way like conducting small scale research individually. Uh, now here are some of the examples uh, of the resources that we used for our exercise development and um, um, hope we're successful in that. Uh, then when we think about the study outcomes, once again, they are manifold and, and each student will find something I think that that's really interesting and relevant uh, uh, for the particular field. But uh, just to give some examples, so of course the learner oriented ones are developing language and translation competences. Um, and once again, we, we expect that we will encourage further applications and use of the resources that we present here for teaching learning purposes. Um, so now further on, uh, I will show some of the activities they are translated from the same, and sorry if the translation is not maybe that accurate, uh, did my best, uh, just to show uh, uh, how, how students may uh, uh, work with clarin data, with clarin resources. And although this is, uh, once again, this is based on the Lithuanian uh, uh, resources, I think it can be really easily expanded to other languages as well. Um, so now, uh, and, and also once again, if you uh, look at these exercises, uh, you have to understand that we focus on, on students who have no really prior knowledge in corpus linguistics, who are not researchers, who, who maybe this is their first time in, in uh, uh, seeing these type of activities. Uh, but then we, we want them to try out these different uh, tools, uh, resources, so that they can acquire new skills and uh, apply them in the future. Um, so here in the exercise that uh, uh, is uh, shown um, in this slide, uh, we believe that uh, uh, during the process, uh, the students, uh, they do research on various resources um, that were presented in class. Uh, they apply them uh, in practice when translating, uh, searching for synonyms, looking for the most efficient ways to produce translation. So in a way, uh, they try out the hats of, of a researcher, uh, a critic, a presenter, translator, and, and then we had this uh, nice discussion and, and it's really how, how uh, this uh, is developing in, in their conscious understanding what's uh, best for me, which resources, although they may be presented in theory, uh, are really working and, and uh, what I can change. Uh, another example, um, so in this task, uh, we expect students to show a way uh, how translation equivalents can be searched uh, or translation decisions verified. And to make it easier, we provide some pre-generated data with the suggested words, but also encourage uh, them, uh, uh, the students to expand the search to other words if uh, they are more interesting to them. So we get this uh, prefabricated material, but encourage to, um, uh, to expand the research. And here, let's say, um, for the sake of uh, example, uh, we uh, take this uh, abstract noun, hope, built this in original and translated Lithuanian, uh, and uh, we uh, give uh, to analyze abstract nouns, uh, uh, thinking that they have really high metaphorization potential, which was the topic of chapter four, which I'm referring to. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, what we see here, the students extract the data using various software, in this case, Ancong. Um, and uh, what we can see in the uh, uh, hits uh, that in the nominative form, uh, the word in the translator data set has a lower frequency, uh, but still the students, they can compare the adjectival, the verbal collocations, and, and they really very nicely show 
uh, how the key note is metaphorized. And, and then this already uh, helps them to think so how they can search for translation equivalents. Um, uh, let's see here, uh, hope in this case is uh, compared to fire, it can wane. Uh, to flower, uh, to ear balloon, it is personified as a living being and, and so on. So uh, they observe from this minuscule exercise that in original Lusanian fiction, uh, the accompanying color case are really more varied. Uh, um, but then of course they can't draw more conclusions about the richness, lexical richness of originals and translations. So that's, that's uh, uh, another example. And then the last one, the last one, uh, is where we encourage them to uh, try out voyant tools to compare once again original and translation because maybe well it's more typical uh, to use voyant tools not for for to take comparison but for for some kind of a, a different input. So well for illustration uh, for illustration uh, uh, we uploaded a poem here. Um, and uh, of course it is a very <laughs> short piece of discourse, eight lines and and um, it will it, to, to get you a picture because the English uh, uh, version, I think, is uh, well, nah. <laughs> how to say um, it, it in a way the poem it, it uh, represents the experience the narrator is having when uh, he is looking at a field of cornflowers. Um, and the boundaries between the blue field, the horizon, the air, and the sky, they, they disappear. Uh, it's blue. Uh, whether you open your eyes or whether you close your eyes, everything is in blue colors. Uh, and then when we look at the uh, translation uh, uh, of the poem and a translation of poem, I think it's a science on its own. We can argue about that if a poem can be translated. Uh, but for the sake of example, uh, let's assume that there are certain key words which are important and that they need to be retained. Uh, if you want to recreate uh, at least a similar effect. And in the Lusanian keyword list, we see uh, uh, that uh, the locative case, case in the eyes, um, zero minutes. <clears throat> yes, um, thank you. Uh, is translated, and this is not so in the translation, so the original image is distorted, and the same visualization is seen in the uh, uh, term very function where we see the blue as uh, 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 more prominent than ice, which is different in Lusanian. So in some, we hope that we uh, contribute to open access resources for less used Lusanian. Uh, we encourage to adapt, use, readapt, create the exercises and use the open access uh, language resources for translation language learning purposes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Yes, my name is Raquel Prognoli. I'm a researcher at the University of Parma in Italy. Uh, University of Parma is a brand new member of uh, the Italian Consortium of Clarin. And personally, I'm also a proud member of the board of the Italian Association for uh, Digital Humanities that is represented here uh, today also uh, with our uh, president, uh, Marina Buzzoni. And uh, for the Teaching with Clarin um, call, I submitted um, some material that I designed uh, um, for a full day workshop uh, about uh, NLP. Uh, the slides uh, are divided in two parts. Uh, one is about theory, so an introduction to the main concepts and main methods of NLP. And the second part is an end-on session about the use of some NLP tools available in the Clarin infrastructure. Uh, the target audience uh, of uh, the material uh, are not experts, mainly students and researchers in the humanities, so people with no background in NLP and no particular knowledge about uh, programming languages. Uh, the, the material was prepared and used uh, in a lecture that I gave at the International Summer School Digital Tours for Humanists that is uh, organized by the University of Pisa since 2017. Uh, the last two editions were supported by Clarin, and in particular, the last edition was held in June. Uh, we had uh, 40 participants for two weeks in Pisa. Uh, the majority of these participants were from Italy, but we also had some uh, um, participants from abroad, and the majority of them were in presence in Pisa. 
but uh, it was an hybrid event, so um, some participant was online. Uh, the, um, the aim of my lecture at the summer school and as a consequence, uh, uh, the aim of the slides was to provide an introduction to NLP uh, to those who are not familiar with NLP, but also to provide a step-by-step -step guide on how to use uh, some of the tools available in the language resource switchboard provided by Clarin, and also give uh, a simple uh, but real example of a complete workflow from raw text data to data visualization, uh, passing through uh, NLP analysis. Uh, to uh, perform the activity that I propose, uh, you need very basic things. You just need an in internet access because the tools uh, uh, that we use are online, our web-based tool. You need text editor, you need a spreadsheet editor, uh, and uh, a raw text file. Uh, together with the, uh, the slides, uh, I provide also a sample of a text file, the same that we have used uh, uh, in PISA for the summer school. Uh, it's uh, a, a chapter of uh, a, um, travel writing. It's taken from a data set uh, called Travel Writings on Italy. It's a data set of uh, uh, English reports, uh, guides, and uh, um, diaries of uh, traveling in Italy in the, at the end of the 19th century. And it's a data set that is available in the Ilpur Clarin repository. And of course, you need the credential to access Clarin services, at least for some of the, uh, of the tools. Uh, as I said at the beginning, the slides are divided into parts, and the first part is about theory. And so in the slide, you see a, a list of uh, uh, questions that form the basis of the first part. Of course, as you can see, each one of these questions can be the topic of a lecture or even of a world workshop, okay? So I know, but the idea there in, for that uh, uh, lecture was to give uh, uh, basic notions, basic answers uh, to these NLP issues, uh, remembering that to simplify does not mean to trivialize. And for end-on session, we have used a, a set of tools that are available on the switchboards. So we uploaded on the switchboard the English test, and we've used WebLeak, UDPipe, NameTag, and NLP Hub. So in the slide, you find uh, instructions with a lot of images about, about how to use these tools. And so using these tools, it was possible to cover some very important NLP tasks, uh, tokenization, part of speech tagging, lemmatization, uh, syntactic analysis, morphological analysis, and part of speech tagging. Um, the slides also provide some instruction on use Tundra. Uh, Tundra, we have used it in the in the lab, in in the in the summer school, uh, so to uh, explore the output of the pipe. And then we have also used a geo browser provided by Daria uh, that is accessible also using the Clarin credential. Uh, the geo browser was used to uh, geo tag the uh, place names that were automatically extracted with name tag. So in this way, uh, that the participant had the possibility to see how to uh, start from a raw text, uh, use an NLP tool, and then see a, the a visualization of the output. Uh, of course, during the, 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 that day, uh, I had the possibility to talk with the participants and I had very positive feedback about the tools provided in the switchboard because they tend to have a very user-friendly interface and they really appreciate the fact that uh, they don't need the installation, they don't need programming skills or command line skills to be used. Um, and so they, they were happy about this very simple way to use them. On the other side, uh, we had several participants working on Italian and or studying uh, Italian li linguistics or working on ancient languages like ancient Greek and Latin. And they noticed that uh, the av availability of tools is not the same for all languages. So uh, there are languages that are covered with a lot of tools and a lot of NLP tasks that are available and other languages that uh, are, are less rich of uh, resources, even in Clarin. Um, so uh, they hope is to have more tools for these languages uh, very soon. 
And I want to conclude just with a brief note about the, the usability of the material. That is a very important point for Clarin. Uh, so the, the slides are available in different formats, not, so not only PDF, but also PowerPoint. You can just take the content that you need or maybe expand uh, the slides with new material. And the end zone session can be easily adapted. So you can use a different type of text. Or maybe an, an interesting application would be to have uh, students and participants of uh, your training uh, uh, event working on their own data. For example, some data about uh, the master thesis or the PhD thesis that, um, on which they're, they're working on. Of course, if you use the material and you find something uh, or you, you think that there is some point that is not clear, please let me know. I want to, to, to improve them as um, the more, the more <laughs> possible. Thanks a lot.